Hello, I'm Hotep, and welcome to this latest transmission of the Egyptian Magic Podcast. I'm Mog Morgan, companion of Seth, and knight of Shambhala. Uh, please do keep the feedback coming. Uh, you can find me on the usual social media channels, like Twitter, Facebook, uh, and all the rest. And do check out my uh, books on Egyptian magic. Uh, go with this podcast. Uh, there's actually a book called Egyptian Magic, but there are other ones related to this. And it's Connections, which are all, as I say, heavily illustrated and often have images and sources that crop up in these uh, chats. I usually try and put one of them on the, the header for the uh, podcast, but uh, there's usually other things that kind of help with the understanding or, you know, fill it out a little bit. I should say, oh, I better say set NPEX. Set is strong. It's, uh, since I last spoke, it's the beginning of a new lunar uh, month in the reconstructed Egyptian calendar. Uh, and in the version I use, this month is actually called Tech, uh, which means cup. So it's the month of the cup, but uh, could be taken as associated with the, for me anyway, with the god Set, uh, who's my chosen deity. Uh, and I think sometimes the way the, the ritual calendar works is that uh, you, the first god in the, in the whole cycle of the of the year, it would be the one that that was popular in that particular region or city or whatever so that's why I kind of do that but I would say you can kind of choose an alternative if you're not into set uh, you just do it, do it as the month of Thoth, is, you can repeat the month of Thoth, uh, which is another way around it that I suggest in the books. Anyway, so it is a full month devoted to set, but as he comes up quite a lot in in these talks I probably don't have to do too much, but I might share with you uh, a little bit of an invocation that we used the other day, uh, connected with that. Last time I spoke about the mystery of the Sphinx, which seems to have gone down quite well, and I can justify returning to a subject, because it's quite a rich subject. I also... Gave a kind of talked a little bit about the sacred vowels. Well, I didn't really talk about it, but someone had asked about the opening rite that I used, and I suppose I started to explain that. And in rather a half hearted way, I kind of did the vowels, but so I thought I'd go back to that and maybe give them a little bit more expression and explain some something of where that comes from. So I'll do a little bit of that, and I may well return to the uh, subject matter of the pyramids and even the Sphinx and other sacred sites and how they, how we extract magic from these places or how they fit within our within modern magic, really. What we, how we connect with them and how they are still relevant to modern magic and how they teach us certain things, which is a theme that I, I, comes up a lot. I know. So I hope to return to that, uh, to talk a little bit about Abydos as well, as, is the, as I usually start with the thing that, I, that is called the Abydos Arrangement, so sooner or later we are going to have to talk to Abydos. Uh, so here's the opening, there's a little bit more given in the book, uh, I usually start with this, with this traditional thing from the Golden Dawn, Hekas, Hekas, Este, Vivaloi, love and do what you will. And then I think about the, the northern direction, which might seem a bit surprising, but it, 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 it makes sense, and call to mind the constellation Ursa Major, which is very, very important in all types of magic, and especially in this Egyptian system. Just thinking about uh, the constellation is almost enough. Obviously, we can see the real thing, but you kind of draw, always drawing on its power. Then this thing that I call the uh, Abydos arrangement, which 
again I move to the east now so I start facing north and the constellation the eternal stars whether in my mind's eye or maybe even physically and then I turn to the east which is one direction in which to start the process and that's the point in which I would do the uh, Abydos arrangement Guardians of the House of Life at Ombos before me in the east Netflix behind me in the west Isis on my right hand in the south is Set on my left hand in the north is Horus above me shines the body of Newt the sky goddess and below me extends the ground of Geb the earth god and in the centre abide of the great hidden god so that's the Abydos arrangement and we're talking about Abydos a little while now at this point one does a thing of vibrating vowels and I sh this is this is a bit in in ritual work sometimes in ritual work especially when you're starting out you you have to have a people used to call it a banishing ritual or an opening ritual a centering thing you you need something there's usually a ritual that's the first thing that you ever learn when you go into magic uh, for me, this was a long time ago, and I was uh, learning it from Alistair Crowley's book, uh, Liber ABA, and Magic in Theory and Practice, sometimes called. And he gave, he had his own version of this ritual, but he also gave the, what was the orthodox version, <laughs> as much as anything can be orthodox, which was the pentagram ritual, that he'd learned from the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. So they had a, a thing called the pentagram ritual and for one reason or another uh, usually when you get into this sort of magic even if you get into Crowley you don't necessarily learn his version of this straight away and some people don't even like his version some people do you tend to use the pentagram and the hexagram rituals from the, from the golden dawn uh, and there are all sorts of mysteries attached to that you know this sort of asshole Malkuth type thing uh, I, I remember well, it was it was actually quite exciting learning this uh, ritual and repeating this almost every day in the end it was quite, it was quite slow at first but it has this effect of kind of uh, unifying things in a way uh, in your body and centering you and giving you a sense it feels quite spooky as well when you first do it Anyway, that's the that's the pentagram ritual you can read about in various books, and you, you could probably on the internet there's probably films of uh, people doing this because it, when you look at a ritual in a book, it's it doesn't really give you the the full flavour of it. You don't get the sounds and the movements necessarily, uh, and it's often the case, you know, the people even the way that you uh, intone things gets passed for all you, usually you get it from from meeting other people I mean that was a funny thing when you first meet magi other magicians you often you know, the way that you learn these things alone from books and then you meet somebody else and you find that you've been kind of pronouncing things in a different way or whatever and that's always a kind of interesting process and you kind of quietly think well they're doing it kind of better than I, <laughs> I am I was very familiar with that you know think oh god that's a kind of a powerful way of doing it but in the end that ritual has is it's based on uh, Hebrew prayer I think and it, it uses four archangels from the the Hebrew Kabbalistic tradition to take the quarters and there are pentagrams and signs and whatever so in a way it fixes you in into a particular system which is obviously one of the most important of the magical traditions the the Jewish tradition the Jewish and the Egyptians are the, uh, as crops up in a prayer that I was using the other day are the kind of two great magical cultures that one bows to almost every time you do a little bit of magic there are other ones as well perhaps the Hindu and the uh, Arabic as well, but those two uh, most famous for their magic. 
but I was quite interested to discover uh, from from again from books, but also from a bit of research as I got more into the Egyptian magic, that the Egyptians themselves, the the, the actual practitioners of magic, uh, uh, with of a sort that's comparable to to what I'm talking about, they had a way of creating a sacred space. Uh, and a set of techniques that they they used that were really really important for their magic. And one of the things that was very important for them was the manipulation of sound. Uh, and the simplest form of that crops up in a ritual that they do to open the space. And th this is based on old uh, Egyptian sources and magical papyri themselves. So it is kind of strange, I suppose, or mysterious that that the pentagram ritual... Well, I guess the people who wrote the pentagram ritual, well, maybe they were aware of this older tradition. I don't know why they, if, if that was for why they didn't use the older tradition in a way, because it has a lot of things going for it. And in the years since I've been studying magic, the... This particular approach has, has been popularized more, and its value has been really appreciated. So, basically, instead of using recognizable words uh, like the names of angels, like Raphael or Gabriel or whatever, or using recognizable uh, Hebrew chants or mantras or Hindu mantras or whatever it might be, one goes to the soul of the language. This is how they would have looked at it. Would then the soul of language, the soul of any language, is are the vowels, and, and you know, you can tell that through because some, some languages don't even mention the vowels. You know they're there, but they kind of keep them sort of secret. It's almost like the hidden soul of a language, and and a very important technique in the ancient magic of the Egyptian variety was connected with making songs and sounds connected purely with vowels. So, what I'm going to do is just go through a very, very simple form of that, which, which replaces the old pentagram rite and is used as a, a rite to open the space if you need this sort of rite. You don't always need this, but when you're first starting out in magic, it's, it's a kind of... It's good for the psyche anyway. It sort of sets you up, but after a while, sometimes you you, you feel you don't need this. Uh, if you're in a special temple or whatever, maybe the temple is already a sacred space. It, it doesn't need extra enlivening, or maybe it does. But whatever. So you've got seven sacred vowels. So again, from an English point of view, we only have five vowels, but actually there's thought to be seven really, uh, basic vowels that the, that the human vocal cords are capable of articulating. There's seven sacred vowels in the, in the ancient world, and seven being a very, very special magical number that will recur a lot in the kind of uh, stuff that we look at. And people made in, entire songs and or the, the way they developed this technique. But the way, to, the, the way I got to remember them because I'm not used to set seven vowels, it's, it's through a little new mnemonic device that, uh, which is father get gain to feed the hot new home which maybe doesn't make a lot of sense but it, it kind of tells me how to make each vowel slightly different because otherwise they're, they're, a couple of them will, will sound very very similar, especially for a English speaker, where we're not known for the richness of our, of our vowels in a way, we tend to sort of uh, simplify things quite a lot. So I was just going to do that little bit, uh, which I had a little go at last time, but I kind of didn't really, probably didn't make a lot of sense. So we're facing the east, and we vibrate the first vowel, <coughs> which is. Then I would look or turn to the north and do the second vowel. 
which is a Keep moving till I get to the west, and I would do a then to the south e. then to the east. Then to the center, ooh, and then up to the sky. So the seven vowels give you the four directions. The earth below us, your heart in the center, and then reaching up into the sky. So the, the ground, the middle, and the above. And that's the four, that covers every possibility. I think maybe when I did that, I, I made my own mistake, <laughs> which is... Uh, two of them were a bit similar so remember I mean, so it should be the first one is uh, as in father so ah that's okay to the north would be as in get eh. then to the west eh. the south E to the earth O to the center O and to the sky O So I hope I got it right that time. But then there raises another issue when you, with this sort of magic. Whatever way you look at it, whatever you write on a bit of paper, you're bound to make a mistake. Especially if you get a very good friend. I <laughs> used to always get so emotional and excited whenever we did a ritual that he'd kind of often get things the wrong way round. We all do this, in fact, or you forget a quarter, or, you know, you, you, you get the word wrong, or you can't pronounce it, or you get stuck. I mean, in a way, I think you just have to prepare yourself for that. If you've got the mindset that thinks if you make a mistake in a complex ritual, then, then everything's spoiled, or worse, then you're not really... You, you you won't be able to stick with that point of view for very long. Uh, you're bound to make mistakes. The rituals, in a sense, are often so complex that mistakes are inevitable. You know, some, some of the grimoires are so complicated, it's almost like it wants you to make a mistake. So what happens then? You know, it, what happens then? Do you give up? Are you eaten by demons? Or is there something, in the end, these things are always, there's always an intuitive element to them, uh, and there's always an element of intention. It's the intention that will carry you through. And making mistakes and getting it slightly wrong, I think you have to, don't call them mistakes, that's part of the process, really. That's the feeling and emotional side of things. I would say, that. I mean, obviously some people are much better at, remembering their lines than others but I think there's a way around it and there's a lesson from it and sometimes the mistake is itself educational if something new comes of that and that has to be accepted as well that was as I say a very simple 
performance of, of the, the Seven Sacred Vows. It's an incredibly important piece of uh, magic that's been uh, retrieved from, from the ancient world, whose uh, implications are enormous, really, from magic and I wish when I was starting out, <laughs> I'd been introduced to some of these ideas. I mean, you can, they're, they're basic mantras, and once you get into a rhythm, you can make all sorts of songs with them and, and all the rest. And in the ancient magical papyri, they, they have quite some quite complex versions of them as well. But that's the basic one. And so that would be my setting up right for this sort of stuff, my basic fallback position I might do other things but that's that's how I normally would suggest that we start a ritual and the thing I like about it is the vowels even though I got this learned this technique from the Egyptian tradition and or the Gr the Greek and Egyptian tradition really the two sort of systems merged together in Egypt uh, and the Greeks came up with this simplification or version of the things that the Egyptians accepted. They, 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 often it, that would be the way the Egyptians, uh, the Greeks would innovate and the Egyptians would say, well, well, they might say, well, we knew that already, of course, we were already doing that, which is one strategy, or they just accepted it. I thought that's quite, they're quite flexible, that's, a, that's a quite a good, good idea. And that's another interesting thing to think about. Uh, Egyptian magic is that it is flexible and, and intention does play a role and it, it does change it's not so strict as, as you would think from the movies and all and that, that the oh, simplest mistake oh they can't accept anything that they're not flexible enough it's a very humane system really in, in lots of ways so that was the vowels so last time I talked a bit about the Sphinx and I partly inspired by reading this book which I've got a copy of now, the Red Sea Scrolls which is rather, I almost finished it it's, it's, I raced through it really it's been such an interesting book not just about the new discoveries which really tells people really clarifies how the, the pyramids of the Old Kingdom were were built, the kind of logistics of it, which doesn't always sound the most interesting thing to to, to read, the log books of people, a group of workers, but somehow or other it does bring out a lot of the mystery, but also it's co-written, the co-writer Matt Lerner is an expert on the pyramids, and he talks about an, another related thing, which is that the great, the great Pyramid of Khufu has uh, three chambers in it, famously. And it was only after last time I was talking that, that I mentioned how the idea of a, of the Egyptians, how they, they kind of like to refer to a, a a previous time. The way, the way I put it, the, the Egyptians built the pyramids, but but they also built this myth of Atlantis, the, the the Atlantean myth. This would have been something. It's not to say that the, the, I mean, in some sense, they oh, of course they had ancestors, and there is an Atlantis or a previous creation in their in their head. But it, usually, what the thing I was arguing against was the idea that the Atlanteans were the ones who built the pyramids. That the pyramids weren't built by the Atlanteans or, or aliens or whatever. The pyramids were built by the Egyptians. But the myth of the Atlantis was also built by the Egyptians pretty much at the same time. And I thought of another example of that from the pyramid itself. Famously, another one of its mysteries is that it has... Three, as I say, three chambers. There's the king's chamber, which is the the one you, if you're lucky enough to go there, you get to visit, which is a rather a remarkable place. You've got a thing called uh, below this the uh, queen's chamber. Although the queen's chamber, it wouldn't, from what they know about uh, Egyptian burial practices, the queens wouldn't have been buried in the pyramid. There, uh, they had their own pyramids just outside or their own tombs. 
So what I don't know why it got the name of Queen Chamber, but maybe because it was uh, they thought that was an obvious meaning for it. It's more likely that it was uh, some sort of it was also Khufu's chamber for for the his car his car spirit to live. So his body was in one chamber, his car spirit was in another. But people often point out there's a a third chamber in the Great Pyramid, uh, the uh, the subterranean chamber. The the two the king and the queen's chamber are built into the masonry of the pyramid itself in those stone ma massive stone pyramid. In their they built chambers with the king with the sarcophagus and tunnels and all the rest. But the bedrock that it's built on the pyramid they they also burrow, burrowed into that. Uh, quite far down, and they they built what's called the subterranean chamber, which is almost like it, it kind of looks unformed in a way. It looks kind of formless. So people say it's it's uh, it's an abandoned chamber. That's one thought. It looks like they started building and then they they decide to abandon it for some reason and go on and build these other chambers. Or maybe people would say, well, this is this was the original thing, if you like. Maybe this was the archaic thing, and they're, they're building the pyramid on top. But the, the interesting thing, all three chambers were constructed at the same time, and with the same thought, in the same mental pattern in mind. So the idea of, it's almost like they decided to build an archaic chamber, they decided, they probably made the decision to, to have an unfinished chamber. They never intended to finish it. It is finished in a way, in this unformed primordial form, as a representation of the of the underworld, really, of the, the underworld of the soul, of the underworld of the soul, which is a very ancient, very, very old Egyptian idea that, that at some point the underworld of the soul is, is, is this place where, in a sense, it's a strange way to put it, they didn't call them this, but the Atlanteans, their very distant ancestors, who, in a in a other version, version A, if you like, of, of Egypt, long before the establishment and unification of Egypt, they made a, a civilization which was destroyed in some mythical event. This is difficult to interpret because these are Egyptian myths themselves. You know, this, uh, so it's not that the archaic chamber is from that time, but it's, it doesn't, it's not. It's built at the same time as all the other chambers. But it's important from them, from a magical, symbolic point of view, the Egyptians, to reference that time by building an archaic chamber uh, representing the, the underworld of the soul, the, the soul of Egypt itself from some prehistoric time. Now that kind of process, if you found one example of it, of it in Egypt, you'd think, well, it's, it's a little bit speculative, maybe, maybe it's something else, maybe they just didn't like it, or the, there were kind of geological conditions that meant that they could never finish it, and they decided to do it another way. But given the fact that this uh, construction, this magical form of construction with these three chambers, with an archaic uh, element to it pointing to an old time, given that that is a, a feature of the Egyptian culture, the Egyptian magical religion, really, that you encounter in lots of other places. It's obviously there's a message there. <laughs> they're sending a message to, to, to the future, really, or certainly they're, they're wanting to pay uh, some sort of homage to this previous creation. This is subtle, I know. The people would say, ah, oh, well, there you go. It must have been built by aliens. But we know it wasn't. It was built by them. But it's built by them to look as if it's been... It's a survival from, from an ancient time. That's the message. That's, that's the way they're encoding it to you. This is quite a strange, worth meditating upon. You know, I found this very, very productive. At some point, 
when we started doing this series, I, I, I'm kind of going through this progress of how I encountered and learnt about this material in, in, in steps. But Abydos links us to, the, to this mystery of the pyramids that I've just mentioned, the subterranean world. Because there's another amazing example at, at uh, Abydos of this reference to the past. And lots of different references to to a past, and I don't uh, I, I don't mean the Egyptian I mean the Egyptian past, but but also to their prehistoric past, which they seem to have been constantly connected with. Uh, is part of their song line, if you like. That we don't, we, we only see hints of. We have to kind of reconstruct it. But for them, it was a very living reality, and a very important part of the magical religion that they practiced. Which is why I suggested that we have to know these things, and we have to incorporate them into our own version of the uh, magic in order to make it work. So Abydos, Abydos is a uh, royal cemetery of the Egyptian. Egyptians in the very early dynasties, uh, right at the beginning of their development, whereas Giza and the Saqqara and the, the monuments around the desert in the vicinity of Cairo is the cemetery of a later time. They seem to have moved there, still a long time ago from our point of view, one of their most holy pilgrimage sites and sacred sites when they first became a uh, uh, a country, a unified country, w was Abydos. It's one of the world's most remarkable ancient places, and it's been a major pilgrimage site. Well, we don't know when. Lost, I usually say lost in the mists of time. The site is immense, with all sorts of monuments there from all sorts of periods, including prehistoric stuff. So, so it, it more than justifies its status up until certainly until Christian times and maybe even were well, certainly revived again now as a place of pilgrimage uh, a very special magical place now one of its surviving treasures is the mortuary temple of Seti the first who's uh, one, uh, the father of Ramesses the second who must be Egypt's one of Egypt's most famous kings, the one who appears in the Bible, and all this sort of stuff. But his father is Seti the First, who was rather a special figure as well. The nineteenth Egypt's nineteenth uh, dynasty, in a sense of, by the time that came in, this is the so-called New Kingdom. Egypt's capital has actually moved to a place called Waset, which is just where modern Luxor, which is an important site you can still visit, and there are lots and lots of monuments there. And Seti the First tomb, which again, everything to do with Seti, Seti the First is, is on a kind of another scale, really. As we said, the, 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 the level of uh, monuments and stuff in Egypt, anyway, is, is off the scale in terms of survivals of incredible things. Sorry, his his tomb. He has a very very luxurious tomb in the Valley of the Kings. So he's not buried at Abydos. Uh, he has a, a tomb, a tomb. But it's it's obviously it's customary, and you, this is what makes it quite confusing. For Egyptian kings have several different funeral monuments. It's like Sneferu of the, the the builder of the pyramids. Uh, he, I think he had at least he had three, maybe even four pyramids. I'm not sure if he ever ended up buried in any of them, but he certainly has several built. This is it's obviously the way. That, there are lots of reasons why people might do this. Anyway, Seti the first is buried in the Valley of the Kings, which is a wonderful tomb there, painted tomb. But he has several what they call mortuary temples, which are temples to continue the cult of the departed king after his death. Uh, and these are, from a magical point of view, the analysis of these mortuary temples and the, the, the relationship with the cult of the dead 
and with the with the dead in in general this this is an important aspect of magic you can't completely avoid this the the, the communication with the dead is is an aspect of magic one way or another whether it's symbolically an awful lot of magic originates in this in this moment so analyzing the mortuary temples is is incredibly a productive area to look for magic in fact I should say one of the things that I probably mentioned before was how I got into someone heard that I was kind of into uh, set and everything having been in the Typhonia and OTO and everything like that and they said I needed to their suggestion was that I go and study the temple of Seti the first or the monuments of Seti the first but the temple of Seti the first because his name, he's named after the god Set, so if you're interested in Set, why not look at his temples? And that that was an incredibly good tip, actually. He has several mortuary temples. Uh, there is actually one in Luxor, uh, a place called Gurna, which is a very, very important place in Luxor, uh, in terms of the his history of the site. Uh, that's a, something that we'll have to go into later. So there's a, a temple there of, of Gurna, but he has another one, in better one, the best and greatest of his temples, perhaps the greatest of all Egyptian temples in some ways, although difficult. In terms of decoration, I think this would be true, is the one that he, com he commissioned at Abydos. And the thing I want to focus on with the Abydos temple... Uh, that even if you heard it before, it, it never it's never too many times that you can stop thinking about this. It's quite a remarkable story when you discover it. It, it plays this the temple itself plays this remarkable game with with the observer. It tells you something that you uh, uh, were expected to see, something that you might notice. I mean, the living, presumably the people who came afterwards, are supposed to see this. They're supposed to s spot this really strange mystery about the temple that you won't find anywhere else. Uh, even in the other uh, temples, or several other temples that Seti I built for his funeral cult. And this is the fact, and I put this the, the little ground plan on the... Uh, on the front of this podcast is that the temple has an unusual shape instead of the usual football pitch shape it's L-shaped it has an L-shaped floor plan or ground plan and this is really really unusual and there's a sort of conceit if you like and what you're supposed to believe from looking at the plan of this temple is it's really really unusual and it's in this incredibly sacred place is that as they were building it, Seti's masons, his team of master masons and whatever, as they were extending the temple uh, towards the west, from the east to the west, as is so often the case in monuments, they encountered an unusual ground condition. Something was wrong with the bedrock. And as they investigated, they found in the bedrock an older building, now, th th that wouldn't be so unlikely, given that this is one of the oldest uh, cemeteries in the in the world, really. An enormous site. There are monuments everywhere, one on top of the other. So the idea that you might encounter, you might accidentally break into somebody else's, a previous uh, building. Well, again, you're thinking again of the archaic uh, structure in the pyramid they've encountered a, an, a very old building that they weren't expecting, that everybody had forgot was there. Nobody knew it was there. There were no signs of it above ground. And suddenly, they find a building under the ground. And one way or another, they kind of think, ah, we have discovered the tomb of Osiris, the tomb of the god Osiris, the actual tomb of Osiris, that one of, the god of one of the greatest religions in Egypt. I say you, you, you certainly. Funny enough, they, they'd already found there are already tombs in the desert itself, which is the odd thing. Out in the desert, there are other places. 
the the tombs of the early dynasty kings of uh, uh, of Egypt. One of those was kind of thought to be maybe the, the lost tomb of the god Osiris, and people venerated as such. Uh, and uh, that's it. It tells you you can you can see it there. There's a place called the uh, Mother of Pots with these offerings of bread and beer in these little clay pots. There are so many of them that uh, you know billions of these things in the, in the, in the soil. So it's supposed to be the tomb constructed by masons. So what did they do? So this. This building, as you can look it up and find out about it, when they dug down to it, it was called the. It's been called the Osirion, and it, it's built on the aquifer, uh, the meaning that the, the Nile flows under the ground in the in the subsoil in a shale layer. So they built down onto the aquifer, so the building itself underground fills up with water. It floods. It's almost like a torture chamber in a way. It's 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 constructed to look. It looks like an archaic tomb. It's shaped like a tomb. It's got all sorts of things that look like. Uh, funny enough, there are all sorts of elements to it that look very like the the temple that sits outside the Sphinx in Giza as well. The same sort of masonry. This archaic, very very no carving is very archaic. Masonry pillars, very plain. They look as if they come from some very, very ancient time. And the water and uh, the all sorts of features of it makes it look like it's a place. See, in the myth Osiris, this important myth, Osiris is killed by Set. Uh, and the first that he kills him, he suffers a kind of triple death, and one of the ways he's killed is he's drowned. So the fact that there's the water and it kind of floods into this place and fills the chamber like a coffin filling with water, that's very like the myth of the way that Osiris, uh, that Set is supposed to have killed Osiris is by putting him in a coffin and throwing it in the river. Uh, therefore, he, he it floods and he drowns. So it's a uh, quite a horrific event actually from the Egyptian point of view, the, the flooding of uh, the drowning of Osiris and if that's not enough he digs, he eventually gets the body and he chops it up into parts and the different parts uh, are scattered all across Egypt and the head of Osiris which is another very potent symbol that uh, we'll, we'll have to talk about at some point but I just want to introduce some of these ideas to you the fetish, the head of Osiris forms a fetish which become, is the fetish of Abydos. So his head is there somewhere as well, which is all rather remarkable stuff uh, yet to explore. So, what do they do? They find this very, very old ancient building, so they change the design of Egyptian temples, they throw the rule book out and they end up diverting the temple off in another direction so that they, they can finish the other rooms by putting them to one side so they end up with a strange L-shaped footprint as if, and they incorporate the abandoned crypt of the, called the Osirion into the overall design of the building and then they change the masonry and they incorporate some of the old masonry into the new masonry in this kind of incredible puzzle. So what of this building which we know of as, as the Osirion? Is it really older than the temple above? Was it really, had they really, the Egyptians, discovered something new? Well, archaeologists working on the site confirm that every feature Every feature of the site, every feature was all were all built at the same time. There are no well, funny enough, there are some archaic bits, but it's not this. Right, there's stuff from the prehistoric stuff. Really, it is there somewhere. But the Osirion and these these very old stone architecture and the hidden rooms and all the rest and the blocked off rooms and the change of design, all of it is intentional and it's all done in one moment. 
So it's the equivalent of the abandoned chamber or the archaic chamber of uh, Khufu's pyramid. It's another example of where the Egyptians practiced the art of sacred deception. And, and, and as if wheels within wheels, I have to just mention this, but I say we'll, we'll come back to it, is that the deception continues that the, they decorated the walls of the this stylized coffin, if you like, this enormous tomb of Osiris, with ax, uh, astronomical texts, texts of astronomy and the calendar, including a book called the Book of Newit. Although when Egyptologists translated the Book of Newit, they were, in a way, revolted by it. They, they couldn't quite make out, you know, this just seemed wrong somehow. Strange, wrong stuff. One of the things that interested me also is this uh, Book of Newit. It contains a very old Egyptian lunar calendar, of, and I've used some of that material in my books and in my reconstruction of the calendar. And the calendar is obviously when it was put on the walls had fallen out of use. <clears throat> and the other weird thing about it is that the calendar itself has other bits embedded in it that show an even older version of the calendar that also was never used as far as we know. So it's like in the case that many Egyptian astronomical monuments, they often use a clock that's running backwards. They use the time running backwards. They point to a very, very early time. And this is a feature that recurs a lot in uh, Egyptian mythology and monuments, if you know where to look, that the clock is, in a way, pointing backwards. So, as I say, the Egyptians built all these things in an act of magic, uh, they built the Sphinx, they built the pyramids, but they also built into it this Atlantean myth of an older, buried culture, a buried soul in a way. It's, a, it's the soul, it's the underworld of the soul in the underworld that they kind of are pointing us back to. And that is very related to the power of magic. Uh, it's a power that uh, recurs and that people, if, you, if you're really reviving Egyptian magic, that you kind of have to come to terms with and, and it, it, it's something that gives power to magic. Okay, well that's, that's quite a lot to think about really. It's probably something you have to think to meditate on and, and look at the pictures and think about the implications of that gives you some idea why people think the Egyptian culture is so magical is because of the fact that it has these layers of meaning pointing us back to, to, to some specific moment that we, we still need to uh, come to terms with. Okay, well, time to draw this to an end. I, uh, as it's a month dedicated to the set, I thought I'd end with a few lines from uh, a prayer to set from the Egyptian sources. Almighty Typhon, ruler of the realm above, and master, god of gods, O Lord, Abraman. O dark disturber, Thunder's bringer, whirlwind, night flasher, breather forth of hot and cold, shaker of the rocks, wall trembler, boiler of the waves, disturber of the sea's great depth, Eyal, Erbet, and Tawi Mani, I am he who searched with you the whole world and found great Osiris, whom I brought to you chained. I am he who joined you in the war with the gods, and some say against the gods. I am he who closed heaven's double gates, and put to sleep the serpent who must not be seen, 
who stop the seas, the streams, the river currents. Wherever you rule this realm, and as your soldier, I have conquered by the gods, I have been thrown face down because of empty wrath. Raise up your friend, I beg you, I implore. Throw me not on the ground, O God of gods, but grant me power, I beg, and give to me this favour, that whensoever I tell one of the gods to come, he is seen coming swiftly to me in answer to my chance. Ayeo, Apechti, set great of strength.